Tanya Smith Bryce, Vice President of Education for the Council on Social Work Education. And I'm here with Dr. Iris Carlton Lene, mm -hmm. Professor Emeritus of the School of Social Work at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. As you're all well aware, Dr. Iris Carlton Lene is a premier social welfare historian who has brought to life the role that African Americans have played in the development of our social work profession. And so we're gonna spend this time this morning talking through the winds beneath our wings, a legacy of leadership and change. Good morning, Dr. Carlton Lene. Good I'm going to call you Iris. Is that okay? That's fine, Dr. Bryce. <laughs> call me Tanya. <laughs> Good morning. I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this information because it's really near and dear to my heart. When I discovered all of these incredible people, I was a little upset that I hadn't learned it because I have three degrees in social work. Wow. And it's like, why have I never heard of most of these people? Uh, so actually, I spent a lot of my career just kind of talking about the contributions that these people have made, which are incredibly significant and really should never have been excluded from social work education, but should have always been a significant part of what we teach and what we learn, because we yes. always talk about role modeling and these people are perfect role models and we know nothing about them. Right. So one thing that I'd like to say about what these pioneers did, um, they organized individually, but also through groups for planned change. They established um, agencies, they established orphanages, group homes, old folks homes, settlement houses, uh, national organizations that survive today. Um, they did it through women's clubs, through secret orders, fraternal orders. Uh, they did it through penny, nickel, and dime clubs. Yep. Um, they did it through sororities and um, through churches. <laughs> through, absolutely through churches. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. any mechanisms that they could get their hands on to to address the needs of their community is what these leaders did. And it's always so interesting to me that we discovered intersectionality. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, these, these people are the epitome of intersectionality. They knew that whatever they did, their race, their gender, their socioeconomic status, their place, that all of these things were a significant part of everything they did and all of those various parts of their identity were always considered whenever they made any efforts for change. And I'm just, like I said, I'm just always amazed that people think these, this stuff is so new mm -hmm. when, when it isn't. Okay. So let's talk about some of the individual pioneers. Let's start with the first slide. Okay, this is Mary Church Terrell. This woman, and, and, and Tanya, I'll just say a little bit about each of these people rather than okay. then. Um, much of what she did was through the National Association of Women's Clubs. She was multilingual. She grew up upper middle class. Her father was uh, Robert Church and Robert yes, Church yes. owned Bill Street. And so, he was the first black millionaire or one of the first black millionaires in the country. One right? of the first, yes. And actually both of her, her parents were very wealthy, independent of each other. Right. Because they, you know, she grew up with her father. She was a little girl who went to boarding school. She also had an elite education. She graduated from Oberlin College before Oberlin began to uh, discriminate based on race. Uh, and that, you know, they didn't, they did that, you know, at first everything was okay. Right. And then Plessy versus Ferguson they, and Oberlin kind of said, oh, maybe we should be discriminating based on race. That's but, right. Yeah. <laughs> but she, she went to Oberlin before. And so she lived in residence halls with other, other students at Oberlin, regardless of race. Um, so m much of what she did was through the uh, women's club movement. She organized women's clubs all over the country. Um, and she was always an advocate for change. So even at age 72, I think it was, she was picketing Thompson's restaurant in Washington, DC right. for, for integration. Um, 
and I don't, oh, oh, one other thing that's critical. She was one of two African-American women to answer the call for the formation of the NAACP. That's so you remember the NAACP this, uh, published a call in the newspaper for people to respond to the formation of that organization. And Mary Shusterell, along with Ida B. Wells Barnett, were the two African-American women. And there were, I think, four or six white women who responded to the call as well. And those are you know, our pioneers that we know, like Jane Addams and Florence Kelly, et cetera. Gotcha. OK. Let's see. Charlotte Hawkins Brown. Yes. Uh, I love Charlotte Hawkins Brown, a lady of, of style and fashion. Uh, she started Palmer Memorial Institute in Sedalia, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And Palmer Memorial Institute was a boarding school for middle-class African-American kids. Uh, and um, so she did, she educated the elite among African-Americans. Uh, but she, she was a, a strategic fundraiser. Mm -hmm. So she approached a lot of her Northern white um, friends for funding, but she understood that she, she couldn't say, I am providing an elite education for African-Americans. So she had to talk about trade school and trades education and it kind of, you know, dumb it down so that the white fundraisers would not be uh, intimidated or their sensibilities um, walked upon. So, so that's what she did in order to raise the necessary money to keep Palmer uh, open. What uh, she also, again, very elitist, and um, what she said was she, she, she constantly, I don't know if she really believed this or not, but she constantly said that if African-Americans behaved differently, they would be treated differently. She, by, she, by, she, all, of her, all of her writings reflect that. She absolutely believed that to be true. I, it's hard for me to imagine that somebody this smart believed that, but, uh, but she constantly said it. And so she wrote it in this book which this, can you see this? But you see, it's on the slide. Mm -hmm. uh, the correct thing to do, to say, and to wear. And in that book, she just, she talked about the social graces. Yep. And, and there's a picture here of the Canary Cottage. And, and on Sundays, she invited students to come for tea and you know where they learned the social graces and how to behave a certain way, believing that that change in behavior would ensure more access to opportunities in society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think Palmer Memorial Institute was a jewel in our community. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's, I, I don't agree with everything that she said, but she pro certainly provided a major service and that school provided a, a major service to the community. Well, in addition to the Palmer Memorial Institute, she also uh, founded the Eflin Home for Girls or the North Carolina Industrial School for Negro Girls. And that was a home for what was considered wayward girls or delinquent right. um, black girls in North Carolina. And she, um, as part of their uh, training in social graces, if you will, is that they were uh, pen pals with the kids at Palmer Memorial. and. Um, and so to fundraise for Eflin Home, which she did under the cover of the North Carolina Federation of Negro Women, right. um, <laughs> she made it. She made sure that white folks were clear that Eflin Home was going to be very different than Palmer. That this was not, you know, we're we're just we're trying to get these girls off the streets. We're not trying to, you know, um, do anything more than that. And and so Eflin Home was a little down the street from um from palmer memorial Sedalia. Mm -hmm. from sedalia um mm -hmm. but uh it it also was a very um it actually was the only juvenile justice facility for african-american girls in north carolina right. um, until the late 1940s early 1950s that's right and she modeled that a lot after the Virginia Industrial School for Wayward Girls. That's right. Uh, That's right. And both of those schools had social workers full time on their staff. That's right. That's right. Which, um, which we unique. need to know. That's right. Mm -hmm. It was very mm -hmm. unique. Yeah. Yeah, it was unique. Okay. All right. Thank you. Asa Philip Randolph. So A. Philip Randolph 
um, founded the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. He was not a porter, he was an organizer. So the, the, the porters of the Pullman um, company went to him for him to organize because all the other people who worked for um, Pullman were organized. They could collectively bargain. They were well taken care of, but the African-American porters were not. Um, so Asa Philip Randolph became uh, the organizer for that, for that group. He was just also a national organizer. People credit the March on Washington to Asa Philip Randolph. Um, there are um, institutes still today um, that kind of uh, represent his work and his thinking. Um, I don't know what else to say about him right now. Tanya, want yeah, yeah. to add? I was just going to say the, the, you know, it, it, it is significant that he was part of that organizing group for the March on Washington, both the first one that didn't happen and right. the one that the one that that did happen. Um, mm -hmm. And and so very, very significant piece. So he was accused of being a communist, yes, uh, actually was a member of the Communist Party. And so um, that at the time has a different meaning than it does now. But uh, yeah, that was exactly. typical of social workers. And he was sometimes called one of the most dangerous black men in America. That's right. And, uh, you know, it, knowing that he really could um, have a lot of control over African American movement as a large group really made him an intimidating figure. That's right. And, uh, you know, he did threaten a march on Washington many years before it took place in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And some of some some concessions were made to make certain that that march did not take place right. until right. much later in the 60s. That's right. So A. Philip Randolph. Okay, this is George Edmund Haynes and his wife Elizabeth Ross Haynes. So this slide mainly is about Elizabeth Ross Haynes, mm -hmm. and I have George there because George was her husband and George was prominent. Um, Elizabeth Ross Haynes was a politician also a part of the women's club movement. She was also a member of the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority. So it was through the sorority that she also uh, helped to bring about change in local communities. Um, she, one thing that she did that's really critical is she wrote a seminal uh, piece. It was her, her master's thesis was, was a pretty seminal piece of work on domestic servants. African American women who provided personal service in white homes. And she talked about what that experience was like, but she also talked about how these women's lives were completely um, devoted to those people that they served and that they had very little time for leisure. So she talked about organized leisure and ways to make certain that these women had some fullness in their lives. But the, the significant thing about that research was that it stood for the next 50 years until somebody else started to look at domestic servants and what their lives were like. Um, Elizabeth Ross Haynes married George Haynes. They were both Fiskites. They were graduates of Fisk University. And that lower picture is their grandson, uh, Dr. Bruce Haynes. So if you go to the, the next slide, of George. So I did my dissertation on George Edmund Haynes. Had never heard of him. He was the co-founder of the National League on Urban Conditions Among Negroes, which became the National Urban League. Uh, the National Urban League is a social work organization. Yes. And it really uh, came into exis existence to provide social services to African-Americans who were moving from rural southern communities to urban communities in the north. And the purpose was to make certain that people had their needs met, that they learned how to live in cities, which is a real different way than living in rural farm communities. So the National Urban League tried to help them find employment in cities and also kind of teach appropriate behavior for living in cities. Um, you know, tried to keep African-Americans away from the red light districts, um, and, and, and so in doing that, they, they would have things like newcomers dances so that people who had moved to the city from the South could meet each other at these citywide newcomer dances. And there's still vestiges of that. And I'm not sure they, they exist today, 
but a colleague told me who was from New Bern, North Carolina, that in New York, they still had what was called the New Bunyan dance, huh. where, where people from New Bern, North Carolina all got together for this formal wow. dance, which is really, that's what, that's what the Urban League was doing. Um, so go back to the grandson. Back to that slide. So, so as I did my dissertation on George Haynes, that's how I met Elizabeth Ross Haynes. Um, her papers are a bit more obscure, but you can still find them and learn who she was and what she contributed to social work and social welfare. So while I'm doing this work, I thought I really wanna talk with somebody who knows these people and I couldn't find anybody. One day during, during the summer, I'm in my office and I get a call from Bruce Haynes. And he said, I understand you do a lot of writing about my family. And you know, when I'm talking with him, I'm going, oh my goodness, please let me have gotten this right. So, and it was interesting because what Dr. Bruce Haynes really said was, you know a lot more about my family than I do. And that's because you don't know your family that way. You know, you know him as your grandfather mm -hmm. whom you love and you know he did stuff that was important but the intricacies of it, uh, you miss. So um, we talked for a while and I told him some things that I really wanted to do and some photographs I needed. I said, I wanna see really uh, better images of people because I can write about them better. And he was kind of careful with that saying, I'm really gonna publish a book. So I'm kind of keeping a lot of this close. I said, okay, Dr. Bruce, I understand that. And he has since published a book about them which is really a lot more about the intimacies of the family. Yeah. Um, with, with Bruce Haynes, he's, he was the middle son. He had a younger brother and an older brother. Um, and, and their father was a social worker. So their father was George and Elizabeth's son. And he, he had his social work degree from Atlanta, uh, Atlanta University. Wow. And, uh, but it's interesting, Dr. Bruce does a lot of the same kinds of writing that his grandfather, Dr. Haynes did. And it's about, African-Americans in urban centers. All righty, let's move to someone else. Okay, this is Victoria Earl Matthews. Uh, Victoria Earl Matthews started the White Rose Home for Colored Working Girls. And um, she also started um, a travel aid, traveler's aid because a lot of the young African-American women who moved to the city did not have anywhere really to go. They came looking for a place to, to stay and be safe. So she mm -hmm. would send agents to the docks to meet these unaccompanied young women, to escort them someplace safe, usually to the White Rose home, where they could stay until they were able to take care of themselves because they were often taken advantage of by unscrupulous <laughs> travel agents and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, the White Rose Home um, provided housing for these young women, but it also provided, th this is unique, um, because a lot of women who did domestic work were live-in maids. So they didn't have apartments. They had no private residence, but the White Rose Home would allow them to uh, spend their days off there. So that was like the place they could go and crash for the day. And also they could get their mail there. So their mail didn't go to the, the, the white folks homes where they lived and worked, but they had their own mail uh, delivered to the White Rose home. Uh, the White Rose home, like, like a lot of settlement houses, um, provided a lot of uh, Sunday afternoon lectures, uh, reading clubs, uh, newspaper clubs, um, and, and libraries. The White Rose Home had a very extensive library that eventually became a part of the Schomburg, the New York Public Library. Um, so provided lots of, lots of social services. And uh, she was also part of that women's club movement, uh, a leader in the um, uh, National Association of uh, Colored Women's Clubs. Yep. So one of the things I wanted to add to this, just to kind of provide context, is that those young girls who were coming from the South up North were really many times were escaping 
the dangers of domestic work in yes. a Southern home where yes. they were vulnerable to um, being exploited sexually. Right. Um, and, and so what mothers would do to protect their daughters, and some of them were really young, would move them, send, put them on a train and send them up north. Right. And so many times they came up north, as Iris said, with nobody. Mm -hmm. um and uh and so uh and, and they would leave them to be more vulnerable the other piece is that i'm i'm glad that you said that victoria earl matthews was a leader in the national association of colored women's movement because she does not look like a black woman right right <laughs> no she doesn't she so does. sometimes when in, in my class when i would talk about these pioneers and and I would talk about her in the uh, National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. Invariably, a student would say, but, but I thought these were just about Black women. I said, it, it is about Black women. And, you know, and, and so then there's my opportunity to say, you know, race is a social construct. It so you know, it's, it's pretty difficult to look at people and determine who they are racially exactly. when, it's, when it's, it's a made up concept. Exactly, exactly. Anyway, okay. All right, All right. Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey. I love Marcus Garvey. Marcus yes. Garvey was a genius. And I think, you know, people don't realize his genius because they don't know him. Mm -hmm. uh, all people know about him is the, as, as people like to say quickly, the Back to Africa movement. It's like, mm -hmm. mm, that was just a little bit. Of, Marcus Garvey started the Universal Negro Improvement Association, yes. which was a community organization. And I, I, I look at the UNIA and the steps and the way that it worked, it, it's, it's the model for community organizing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, like, it's like people who talk about community organization must have looked at what Garvey did right. as, they, right. as they plotted out the plan for what it was. Uh, and, and what Marcus Garvey said too was that he wanted people's first loyalty to be to the UNIA. So the UNIA did all those things that community organizations do. In addition, he started the um, Black Nurses, um, uh, Black Star Nurses is what it was called. And it was led by a person who had a nursing degree. And he said that organization existed to take care of UNIA members who had fallen in battle. And he literally mm -hmm. meant that. So, you know, he didn't. He, he, that's what he meant, literally, physically abused uh, and, and physical violence. Um, Marcus Garvey also started a doll making factory yes. to make black dolls because he said little black girls should have images of dolls that look like them. That's right. And this is like 1914, 15, 16. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, even today, sometimes there's a struggle to find black dolls yes, or yes. native dolls or Latinx looking dolls. Um, but Marcus Garvey knew that that was important then because image was important. He knew mm -hmm. that the way you thought about yourself and felt about yourself was power. Mm -hmm. um, and of course he got into some trouble selling stock for his shipping line. Um, and I think it was that interstate commerce stuff that mm -hmm. got him um, uh, exiled. So, and, and, and it was easy for people to um, negate his prominence. And part of it is, you know, is his presentation of self. Mm -hmm. But if you think about Garveyites, the, the people who were followers of Marcus Garvey were middle class, upper middle class, working class. They, you know, it, it, it was the, the gamut. Um, and, and Marcus Garvey often spoke at um, Victoria Earl Matthews um, White Rose home, so, a, 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 as did other prominent leaders in the African-American community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Tanya, anything you want to add to, to Marcus Garvey? Yeah, I just, when I think about uh, Marcus Garvey and UNIA, I think about um, the next iteration of that with the Black Panther Party that the same work that they were doing as a community organizing um, group, uh, that they took a, they took that from UNIA, they just continued it on. Right. And um, so, you know, the, the, the free breakfast and free lunch meals, making right. sure folks had 
groceries and you know the mm -hmm. ambulance service you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um because you know ambulances wouldn't come into black communities that's um, right you that's know right. in a timely manner and 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 then even the whole issues around you know when you talk about black star nursing you know that was one way to address those health disparities and disparate treatment mm -hmm. of black folks um mm -hmm. in the medical setting that we exactly. train our own to do it um so daycare i mean the whole child care piece that women mm -hmm needed to work and so women who needed to work with kids would do so in a child care so other women could you know um go outside of the home and 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 work so it's just um it, he did some amazing amazing work absolutely and you know the the whole notion of social insurance was oh, yeah. provided through the unia because mm -hmm. um commercial insurance was not available to african-americans right so they had to to cool. figure out ways to that's to right. do it themselves, yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. Okay. So this is uh, Marcus Garvey's second wife. This is Amy Jacques Garvey. His first that's wife was also named Amy. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and this wife actually was the maid of honor in his first marriage. That's but he right. met, yes, <laughs> yes, he, he married this woman, and she actually had a tremendous leadership role in the UNIA while he was not able to do it. She was also, um, she wrote a, a what was called the women's page mm -hmm. in the UNIA newspaper, the Negro Voice, I think it was. And the women's page was an interesting uh, uh, addition to the Negro Voice and it focused on African-American women, uh, women's needs. So she had things in there, she had recipes and you know how to manage your home but she also had information about how to organize and how to impact your community. And someone said, um, someone who uh, pulled together a lot of Garvey's writings said that Amy Jacques Garvey tried her hand at writing. And I thought, oh, how patronizing. No, she, she was a writer. And not only was she a writer, she ran the UNIA right. while Garvey could not run it. That's right. Uh, and I think she had, I think she and Garvey had had, had two uh, children, mm -hmm. but she was very prominent, as was his first wife, Amy. Mm -hmm. They were both very prominent in the UNIA. And of course, a lot of that prominence was ignored because of gender. Yep. Okay. Uh, Madam C.J. Walker, every time I look at this, I think there should not be an E on Madam, but Madam C.J. Walker, whose name was Sarah Breedlove, became a millionaire selling hair and skin care products for African-American women. And um, people like to say that she invented the straightening comb, but she didn't. She did alter it, but, uh, but what she did was she cooked up uh, ingredients for African-American women to take care of their hair and to take care of their skin because there were no such products. But in addition to that, to that, which was significant, what she also did was she gave African-American women an opportunity to be business women. That's right. So she moved all of these women who were washerwomen as she was mm -hmm. into real career paths That's right. because and, and it's always interesting when I think about it, she, what Madam C.J. Walker did predates by many years um, what Mary Kay did. That's right. So, you know, we, when we think of door-to-door -door selling and of, of uh, those kinds of products, we think of, we don't think of Madam C.J. Walker, who was right. one of the first people to do that and do it su successfully. Mm -hmm. So her, her, her army, of women selling products door to door was also an organized group of women. And they had a political voice. And she called them, uh, I think it was the, the Walker Hair Cultures Union. Yes. So yes. these women met annually and they they wrote letters to, to the president of the United States about particular social issues. So they learned how to be better business women, but they also learned how to influence and change their communities. Absolutely. They became a real powerful. 
uh, group. But what we also don't think about a lot is that Madam C.J. Walker was a philanthropist. So, you know, when we think of philanthropists, we think, well, there weren't any African-American philanthropists when actually there were a lot of African-American philanthropists. And even though many of them were not wealthy, they were still philanthropists. This woman was wealthy. And there's a recent book that I really enjoy that's written by Tyrone, Tyrone Freeman. And this is it. And it's called Madam C.J. Walker's Gospel of Giving, Black Women's Philanthropy During Jim Crow. Wow. wow. So, you know, we, we, we are finally, well, the literature is, 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 is acknowledging the diversity of social welfare mm -hmm. in the African-American community. Right. And I'm just, I'm just anxiously awaiting the profession to embrace that. And it's, it always surprises me when I read um, articles that talk about the, there being no role models yeah. in the African-American community right. or African-American leaders today. And I'm going, no, there are lots of them if you, if we knew our literature and, right. and if we, we read widely enough, um, we'd know that it needs to have a prominent place and we wouldn't keep repeating the same right. false narrative. And, and even the way in which uh, the Black community is characterized in the, in the literature, um, mm -hmm. that if folks actually knew the strengths, um, mm -hmm. the long-term strengths in mm -hmm. spite of the, um, the systems that um, folks have had to deal with, um, mm -hmm. they would think about our communities a lot differently. That, exactly, um, so, exactly. You know. mm -hmm. I do, okay. Oh. No, that's fine, that's fine. So Ida B. Wells Barnett, one of my favorite people. Yes. And she's one of my favorite people because she spoke truth to power. She, she, she did not bite her tongue. She was a, a recalcitrant, recalcitrant kind of person. Uh, and, but she didn't, you know, she didn't tolerate fools. So she was just, she was very impatient. Um, this woman was an activist, a journalist, a newspaper editor, a suffragist. Um, she owned four newspapers in her life. The uh, uh, Free Speech and Headlight has a historic marker in, in, on Beale Street in Memphis, which is where the paper was. What she needed, of course, was a literary organ so that she could write what she wanted to write. That's right. Uh, so owning her own newspapers uh, was a way to do that. She also published what was called the Red Record. And this was um, a book that sort of chronicled lynchings and the alleged causes for those lynchings. You can actually get a copy of the Red Record on, on, uh, online. Right. You can print, print out the whole thing. It's fascinating. She, um, she also started a settlement house, uh, the Negro Fellowship League and Reading Room on State Street in Chicago. Um, I think she really kind of liked men a little better than she did women. So she, yeah. <laughs> so the, the Negro Fellowship League and Reading Room catered a lot to the needs of African-American men in Chicago. And many of these, these groups did have newspaper reading clubs mm -hmm. because people didn't have access to newspapers. Yeah. So they could go to these um, settlement houses and just sit and read the newspaper. But that also gave them an opportunity to process what was going on in those newspapers and to, um, to organize and to think about strategies for plan change. Absolutely. Um, she was also, as I said earlier, she was the, the other African-American woman who answered the call for the formation of the NAACP. And she was involved with that organization for a short while, but I think for her, they weren't moving fast enough. So she kind of cut her ties with them. She started the Alpha Suffrage Club, which was a specifically a political organization in Chicago. Uh, which is, of course, an ideal place to have a political organization in, in, the, in, the, in the early part of the 1900s. Absolutely. Um, so. 
And there's a lot more about her. And it's, but the interesting thing is the information about all of these people is not obscure. That's right. And we can easily find that information and learn much more about them. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, if we had the political will. Margaret Murray Washington, I think she was Booker T. Washington's third wife. Um, and, um, yeah. you know, she, she did, she was educated like, like all of his wives were. But one thing that she did that was, that's critical um, that we need to know about was that she started a settlement house for women uh, in Tuskegee. So a lot of uh, the farmers, the men farmers, would come to Tuskegee for training, for training institutes and et cetera. Their wives would also come and their wives would then uh, go to the, um, the settlement house. And I can't think of the name of it. Um, and the settlement house would provide opportunities for these women to learn how to purchase land, how to develop land, how to build homes, uh, teaching independence to these farm women. Um, and so in, in essence, strengthening the farm family uh, is what she did. As he was working with the farm men, she worked with the women to help them to understand how to strengthen the African-American family. Absolutely. Okay. I was trying to see if I could find the name of that uh, settlement house, house, but uh, folks could probably- It was the Russell's, it was the Russell Settlement House, I think. Does that sound right? Yep, that does. Yeah. Yep. All right. Okay. Yay. Love Virginia Burns Hope. Yeah, Virginia Burns Hope. Um, interesting, interesting person. Virginia Burns Hope um, married John Hope, who's pictured there mm -hmm. in the lower corner. John Hope was the president of Morehouse. Um, Virginia Burns Hope was a community organizer. In, um, in Atlanta, she started the Atlanta Neighborhood mm -hmm. Union. And the genius of her organizing was that she didn't come in and say, I came to organize the community, but rather she organized community members to organize their communities. That's right. And they organized for just basic uh, human needs that other parts of Atlanta had like trash pickup, like um, um, street electric street lights, like better quality of housing, like healthcare, those kinds of things um, were things that they lobbied Atlanta um, to provide to their communities. She also started a social work institute in 1919, where she developed a series of social work courses to train social workers. That institute existed, I think, for one year. And then in, in 1920, that institute became the Atlanta School of Social Work. She was a very interesting, interesting person. Um, like a lot of these people, she could pass, uh -huh. Uh -huh. but many of the you know, African American community has always had people in our community who could pass. Mm -hmm. And we, we've never outed people. That's not what you do. If people are passing, you let them pass. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. you pass for white. Okay. And um, they would, it, it's always been a, a, a benefit to our community to have somebody who could pass because they would come back with information That's that right. those of us of the darker hue could not get. That's right. So that's just that was just a, 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 a strategy for survival in our community. Mm -hmm. I love that she wrote about, or she was very transparent about creating clubs for boys to keep mm -hmm. them busy and to yeah. keep our young girls safe. That uh -huh. if we could just keep you know our young girls safe by distracting the boys with reading clubs and that kind of thing. They, she also had reading clubs for young girls too, but uh, but she wrote about it in a very transparent yeah. kind of way. Yeah, and it's interesting that she, that she did it and wrote about it, but they all did it. Yes. You, right. know, you know, they, they all made efforts to uh, divert the attention of the boys to something constructive, that's but right. they understood that that was protecting the girls. That's right, that's right. Yeah, yeah they, all, they all did it. They didn't all write about it, but 
they did similar kinds of things. Um, Eugene Kinkle Jones. So I, I, <laughs> I wrote about Eugene Kinkle Jones in an article that was in Social Work many years ago. And it was so nice that somebody read it and responded. And what she said to me was, I knew him. And she oh. said, my, my parents were social workers and he was in and out of our home all the time. And she said, and we called him Kinkle. At the, you know, it's like that is, it's only when somebody knows someone that you get that little bit of, that little, little nugget that the man was called Kinkle. Anyway, Eugene Kinkle Jones was the second executive director of the National Urban League. And you see, I have A Phi A there because he was one of the founders of the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. Uh, it's called one of the seven jewels. Um, Eugene Kinkle Jones was middle class. His parents were well educated. And um, unlike George Haynes, who was not um, as suave and sophisticated as Eugene Jones was, um, Eugene Jones was able to navigate spaces that were a little different from what George Haynes did. But he, when he became executive director, he also um, moved the National Urban League into a somewhat different direction as well. Uh, finding employment for these people who were moving from the rural South to the urban North was something that was really important to him and the Urban League moved in that direction. Um, Eugene Jones was a member of FDR's Black Cabinet. And of course we know that, that it was Eleanor Roosevelt who listened to the Black Cabinet a lot more so than FDR, but they still had some voice because she listened to them. Um, Eugene Kinkle Jones was on the board of various settlement houses. He was on the board of the I think it was the, the Lincoln Settlement House in New York. Well, one of the African-American settlement houses in New York. Um, and you see pictured there is a, is a book about Eugene Kinkle Jones called The National Urban League and Black Social Work. That book was written by Felix Armfield. Uh, it's a really nice, nice book. Of, of George Hain, I'm, I'm sorry, of Eugene Kinkle Jones, um, makes a significant contribution to the scholarship. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Go to the next one. Yes. Okay, Janie Porter Barrett. Um, Janie Porter Barrett, again, also was somebody who could pass. Um, she grew up in the Skinner household she was raised with the Skinner children. So she had a private education along with the Skinner girls. And that was because her mother was a servant in that household. Um, so Janie got this elite private education, just like, um, just like the little white girls that she grew up with. Mrs. Skinner wanted Janie to go to Bryn Mawr, to want her to pass and go to Bryn Mawr. But her mother insisted that she go to Hampton. So she did go to Hampton. She went to Hampton, you know, in style, in a carriage. Uh, and while most of the kids who went to Hampton uh, during that time walked, mm -hmm. Hampton was a working school like many of the early schools. That means that, you know, students had to work. They had to work in the dining halls and the residents mm -hmm. then take take care of the yards and take care of the gardens and all that stuff. Well, Janie had never worked. So that was a, a, a shock to her. And also the, the um, kind of the, the, the motto that she heard all the time was what you owe to your community. So mm -hmm. that you're here, you're getting this education and you have to pay it forward. So she said she never got so tired of hearing about what she owed to her community uh, so she looked forward to Sunday because that was the only day that she didn't have to hear about that. But even though she may have complained about it, yeah. it got yeah. through to her. So she founded the local street settlement in her home. She and her husband, who was uh, uh, on, on the faculty at Hampton, uh, were saving money to do some renovations to their home. And she eventually took that money because she saw a need in the community that a lot of the young girls needed a place to be. 
and they needed to they need to be protected and to learn better how to live as young women. So the Locust Street Settlement became that space for them. She also eventually, and she was one of the a women's club person. And through the Virginia State Federation of Colored Women's Clubs, she um, established the Virginia Industrial School for Colored Girls. And as mentioned earlier, that modeled um, the Industrial School for Wayward Girls uh, at Eflin Homes. Uh, and again, there was a full-time social worker there. Um, okay. And, her, <laughs> and the remnants of her uh, juvenile justice facility for girls still maintains, is still maintained today in Virginia. It's, it's uh, changed up its mission a bit. It's not the same as it was mm -hmm. then, but there's still that legacy. Um, yeah. that's still present today in Virginia. Right, right. Okay. Okay. And the only thing I want to say about uh, Virginia Randolph is that she was a jeans teacher. And so, yeah, so we, you know, we, we don't, we don't often think about jeans teachers, but jeans teachers provided social work services in the, um, in the public schools. Uh, the, the African-American public schools. It, they were called Jean's teachers because the funding came from Anna Jean's who was a philanthropist. And what her Anna Jean's money did, she was, the money would go to say, uh, Virginia Randolph was in the state of Virginia. So, and the Jean's money would go to um, a public school system in Virginia to supplement an African-American uh, teacher. And so they use that Jean's money to supplement uh, teachers who really had supervisory positions. And the motto for the Jean's teachers was doing the next needed thing. Wow. So, yeah. so the, the services they provided were services to ensure that African American kids could get, um, could go to school. And if the next needed thing was a pair of shoes, that's what the D, that's what they did. Okay. So, but she was the first jeans teacher. So I have this picture here. This is someone that I knew in my community who was a jeans teacher. And it was only after I decided that I wanted to, um, to write about Miss Annie Mae Keenan that I found out she was a jeans teacher. So she was the general supervisor of the Duplin County schools. That means the black schools. Um, mm -hmm. She was responsible for securing, placing, and supervising teachers and principals for the black schools. And this is when I was in school. She was in charge of 10 segregated schools for the county's African-American children. She was an extremely powerful person. She was the person who hired and fired teachers and principals. Wow. But as I was, you know, and so I interviewed her, she was in long-term care and I went to interview her it was a wonderful experience. Even though she was in long-term care in need of 24-hour nursing care, the interview I could see was so therapeutic for her. You know, she, she sat up, her voice got clearer and, and, you know, she talked about what she did and why she did it. And she wasn't always popular because she made demands. Right. And, um, you know, she, she said, I, I always wanted them to get as much education as possible. Mm -hmm. So she's the reason that many of the teachers in the county went back and got their master's degrees. Wow. Um, but yeah. And this is uh, Duplin County, North Carolina. North Carolina. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. right. That's right. But she was a genius teacher. And as I was reading some of uh, the information about her, and they talked about this. Some of the funding for her position came from the Anna Jean, Anna Jean's fund. I said, oh my goodness, Miss Keenan was a genius teacher. So I talked with her daughter and I said, did you know that your mother was a genius teacher? And of course she said, I don't know what a genius teacher is. You know, it's what she knew was that her mother was being paid. But yeah, but I thought the motto doing the next needed thing adequately describes their jobs. Absolutely. Okay. You know, so E. Franklin Fraser. Um, uh, not a very tolerant kind of guy. Uh, 
he he was uh it, with the Atlanta school um you know he he agitated people to the extent that he had to leave under cover of darkness to get out of Atlanta to save his life ended up at Howard University um was a sociologist head of the, so the sociology department but as head of the sociology department he brought social work because he understood social work and uh it was the, the, the sociology department that began to teach social work courses under E. Franklin Fraser. Black bourgeoisie is probably one of his most prominent works. Um, he, he, was, he was president of um, the American Sociological Society or his association. Association. association, he's the first African-American president of that organization. And Okay, um, okay, what's next? Maggie Lena Walker. You wanna talk about Maggie Lena Walker? Well, um, I'll, I'll, I'll just say that Maggie Lena Walker um, was out of Richmond, Virginia. She was a, um, a banker. Right. She had her own bank. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so was very wealthy, but was about economic empowerment mm -hmm. um, for black folks. And, right. uh, and you can still see that that uh, legacy um, today mm -hmm. in, in Richmond, Virginia. And she started it with one of those uh, penny saving clubs. That's right. Through um, a fraternal order. Uh, and it, the, they had uh, department stores and other mechanisms for serving the African-American community. She also sat on the board for the Virginia Industrial School for Wayward That's Girls. Right. Right. Um, so you, these, these people were very connected. They had very strong network. So they, you know, as I said, the whole intersectionality thing was just a part of their existence. They, right. they understood that they had to work together and that, you know, they, they understood each other's idiosyncrasies and how to work around them. Mm -hmm. um, like like people learn to do today. And it's so interesting because when we hear conversations today about, you know, the first black woman to serve on whatever board or to do whatever, whatever, it it's it might be the first black in that setting, but this mm -hmm. is not new to black folks to right. have been engaged in um uh, business development, doing philanthropy, sitting in corporate settings. Um, but as you just mentioned, even with the Virginia Industrial um, School for Colored Girls and the North Carolina Industrial School for Colored Girls, their boards were made up of women like this who were very okay. powerful, very connected, had access to resources and, and made things happen. So right. that concept itself is not new. It's just that we have to remember. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Or, or we have to learn. We have to learn. We have to learn. Then we can remember. Yeah, that's right. So let me talk about this person. This is one of my favorite people in the world, Hortense King McClinton. Huh. So, P Professor Hortense, I don't you don't, no. Professor. Well, you have to go see her. She's the first African American faculty member at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. And she was the, a faculty person in the School of Social Work. She taught in the School of Social Work from 1966 to 1986. She's a past member of the National Association of Social Workers and the National Association of Black Social Workers. So this slide says she currently lives in Durham, North Carolina, but she doesn't, now she lives in the Washington DC area. Oh, she, oh. yeah, she is at, um, um, a continuing, continuing care retirement community. Um, and I, she's 102. She is such a joy to talk with. Um, she's very sharp. She always says, Iris, I'm getting so doty. She's not doty at all. She remembers, um, she, she remembers that E. Franklin Frazier was the chair of the department when she got her undergraduate degree at Howard. She wow. she has a master's degree in social work from um, um, University of Pennsylvania. She um, where did Hortense work? 
she had many firsts, of course. Not only was she the first African-American faculty at UNC Chapel Hill, she was the first African-American social worker to work for the VA in Durham in clinical social work. She was uh, the third, I think, the third or fourth African-American to work in the Durham County Department of Social Services. And she recalls that experience vividly. She said that the, um, the, the director of the Durham County Department of Social Services would take all of the staff to lunch to celebrate various things, but he wouldn't take the black staff, the four of them, because he was taking them to a segregated restaurant where the black people couldn't go. So he would offer the black staff uh, some money so that they could go to a black <laughs> restaurant. Uh, and, and Hortense says, some of her colleagues said, well, I don't want it. She said, I want it, give it to me so I can give it to the NAACP. So she was also a, a, an active member of that organization. Wow. She is, she's, she's a wonderful person to know. I really hope that when we get on the other side of this town, you can go see her. She probably lives very close to you. Absolutely. But, but a pioneer in our profession who's, who's, who's still with us, she is a, um, an NASW pioneer as well. Wow. 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 Okay. Well, Iris, it has been a delight spending this time talking with you about these social work pioneers. Um, and I am hopeful that the audience will take some time to go and find uh, out more about each of these wonderful Absolutely. folks and the work that they've done and ways in which it can inform their practice mm -hmm. and inform the curriculum, mm -hmm. um, particularly Absolutely. as folks are looking at ways to have to create a more inclusive curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I wholeheartedly believe that this is one way uh, to do so. And so I'm just so delighted that you took this time to do this with us today. Thank you. It was my pleasure.